What's up everybody, my name is Garrett Hartle and I'm back here at Reach Out Reptiles to bring you guys another locality spotlight. And this week, we're gonna focus on probably one of the least known or maybe least appreciated, but most popular locality that we have in captivity, the Kiowati Island. Kiowatis are kind of like the balance between all the different dwarf and super dwarf localities from that island chain in South Sulawesi where these localities come from. What I mean is, they're not the smallest, but they're very small. They're not the most colorful, but they're very colorful. And even where their island is, is kind of smack dab in the middle of a whole bunch of stuff that's going on down amongst the dwarf and super dwarf island localities. So this boy here, just as an example, is a two year old. He's an adult proven breeder at this point, but he definitely has a little bit more growing to do. However, as you can see, really rich color, kind of got a lot of, of stuff going on, super high saddle counts, very moderate size. Probably, honestly, one of the best all around localities if you just wanted a great sort of beginner, pure locality animal. They're still fairly expensive because they're not exceedingly common, but what I meant when I said they're, they're one of the most common in captivity is actually that this island was brought in in mass in the very beginning. In fact, it's one of the first animals that could be considered a super dwarf that was brought in with locality data. However, nobody later heard anything about Kiowatis. And so a lot of the animals that were brought in as super dwarfs that were actually Kiowatis were assumed to be Kalatoas and unfortunately bred into some of those Kalatoa bloodlines and the subsequent generations of Kalatoas have been misrepresented ever since. These guys have a really rich golden color, lots of deep saturations, and because some of the bloodlines have a more generic pattern, this is, believe it or not, a generic pattern for a Kiowati, as beautiful as he is, they can be very easily mistaken for Jampeyas, for Kalatoas, and so when they're blended in, they, they really mess a lot of stuff up. So sometimes when you see those, maybe those Kalatoas that just look a lot more golden than they should, or those Jampeyas that are a whole lot smaller than they should be, there might be some Kiowati bloodline lurking. These guys, as amazing as they are, are probably the cause for the dilution of most of the bloodlines of the pure localities we have in the United States. You see, a lot of those early imports were adult animals and they were very difficult to breed because they basically hated it in captivity. And coincidentally, the way the Kiowatis were established so rapidly was because there was a couple of animals who were imported by Bushmaster. There's some very famous pictures of really teeny tiny little Superdorf females on a pile of eggs. You guys might remember from the old like Fauna Classifieds forum days and things like that. Uh, a little Google search might and some research might help you to find some pictures of the founding of, uh, of the Kiowati bloodlines. And there was one guy who, more than anyone else, was really just interested in them as they are. He wasn't a, a big retic breeder or anything. He just had a very tight collection of a few python species that he really enjoyed. His name was Dr. Winslow Murdoch. The cool thing about some of this history, guys, is that you don't have to take my word for it. Why don't we just ask Dr. Winslow Murdoch himself? We're actually here with uh, my recent friend, former inspiration, Dr. Winslow Murdoch. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, the pleasure is mine. When I was a kid, you were really the only person bre actually breeding any kind of locality dwarf and super dwarf. I got my animals 89, uh, I'm sorry, 99. And then I started working with them into, uh, in, I started breeding them in 2002. And, and I started working with, you know, with, with uh, Retix, wild caught stuff, back in around 1975. So that was well before you were born. Um, back when I was, uh, you know, in practice, kind of getting established with a family, um, and I was working with, uh, with green tree pythons at that time, um, I really saw that there was an, a, an opportunity to get into a smaller animal that I could actually have and raise children with in my own, in my own house. So that's um, when I really saw the ad come up. It was, I saw the ad from Cameron, uh, Templeton at Bush Bushmaster Reptiles. Um, he had imported two gravid females that came in from the island of Kiowati that were both gravid. Um, they laid eggs for him shortly after they were arrived in, in Boulder, Colorado. 
Um, one was about six foot, the other one was about seven foot long. Um, one had, I think, nine eggs, the other one had 11 eggs. They hatched and then he resold them through Pro Exotics and Robin Marklin uh, at Pro Exotics uh, had them advertised. I had been following and bo bo bothering uh, Bushmaster, but then he told me he was gonna outsource for the sales to, to Pro, Pro Exotics. So uh, Robin sent me 2.2 unrelated animals, uh, you know, two from each clutch, um, so that I could raise them up and see how well I could do with that. At the same time, they were still importing wild-caught coyotes, but I really wanted to have something that was captive board if I possibly could, to make sure that the lines were pure and that they did well under my care and really thrived. And, and this is the coolest thing because, as far as I can recall, I don't think anybody had made pure locality any of the dwarf or super dwarf islands to that point. And, and really they didn't either. They just had imported these gravid females that laid eggs. Right. So, I mean, the babies that you got, they were captive hatched, but as far as like genetic diversity goes and everything, it's all straight off those islands. Correct. And nobody was really breeding retics in large numbers at that time. So um, I, I had a lot of success with green tree, tree pythons. Uh, I started working with those back in the uh, early 80s. And uh, I was really looking forward to, to breeding pure line, chi, you know, Kaiwati reticulated pythons, as opposed to um, most other animals, the the the, the jampias, and, and there wasn't really a good knowledge about the other islands in that island chain. So really, all we had were the the jampias, and some people were talking about super dwarfs. And the thought was that these animals came in so small, gravid, and laid uh, fertile eggs that they were going to be the true super dwarf that people had been talking about. So they and, were and they that, were theoretically the very first super dwarf articulated python on the market. And, and the coolest thing about that was that you kept that Kiowati knowledge, really, because that's the one thing that you did differently that I think nobody else did in the early 2000s. Everyone else said, super dwarf, yay, that's what people, they hear the name, they want to buy it, that sounds great, super dwarf, you know. And it was a heavy, heavy used marketing term. So you, you knew they were Kiowatis. So fast forward a few years from my wild caught Jampea. I wanted a, a captive bred animal too, you know, and, and it's night and day guys. Everyone always, they still say, oh, I wish I could find a wild caught animal and start my own bloodline. No, you don't. They're, they're awful. <laughs> no. They're terrible. They <laughs> usually don't breed, you yeah, know? Yeah, well, having been through other Indonesian reptiles and, and snakes with the green tree pythons, a lot of the wild caught stuff would maybe breed the very first six months you had it in captivity if it was in good in good shape, and then they would just drop off. Yeah, and, and then 10 and or 12 would, years later, yeah, you could keep exactly. them out long. <laughs> right. And, and, and the coyotes 14 years that, that came in, I, I got uh, from Mike Wilbanks, I bought a, a male uh, to kind of, you know, bring in some new bloodline. And uh, it was just a, a, an unhappy animal from the get-go. It wasn't mean. It was kind of, you know, a little bit uh, squirmy. You got a wild caught one. I got a wild caught oh, one. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's yeah, cool. from from Mike, and and uh, it just never thrived. So the only ones that really did really well were the ones that I had produced, um, the ones that I got and raised up. And uh, and over the years, I've actually been, they've been in my possession. I've, I've worked with the Kiowatis now since 1999. Yeah, and so the cool thing is. I mean, there's just so many advantages to it, right? Like, first of all, you have animals that are, in my opinion, as good as a wild-caught animal as far as genetic diversity mm -hmm. goes. But you have the option, like, when I would get a wild-caught animal, I get whatever they caught and put in a bag. But when you're getting, when you're following it like that, you saw the ad, you chased down Robin, you said, I want those, I want 2.2 unrelated and then I'm sure you picked out the best animals you could get your hands on. Yep. You have options, you have options with captive bred. I had been following, I had followed the whole story I knew of you, I mean obviously I didn't know you at that time, and this is back in the days where like, I couldn't go on your website or anything, yep. you know? Yep. Yep. <laughs> when I was a kid then, I finally, when I was like getting serious about it, I wanted some of this stuff. There were very few like locality animals, like I said there was the jampeas, um, but by that time, I couldn't find any of the, like, the jamps that I really wanted. Everything was like the gas bar line stuff. I wanted some of the smaller stuff. Um, and I found somebody that had Kiowati reticulated python. Mm -hmm. So I got a hold of them. I actually believe it was in the penny saver 
an old it's kind of like Craigslist, but yep. they used to print that stuff on paper. Yeah, that was how I would, <laughs> would, would get a lot of my feeders. I'd get a yep. lot of my animals. So uh, you had the penny saver out well, here, that, too? Or we would just, or, or the Inquirer, the Philadelphia Inquirer, right. the ma major paper. You'd look through the classified ads every Sunday yep. and make sure there was no special animal that somebody just right, uh, right. didn't realize And that was they had exactly gem, what it is, because someone's you know, like, check it out. lizard, you know, yeah. my son doesn't <laughs> want it anymore, right? But then when you see Kiowati, I'm like... What is this? So I called him up, and it was somebody had got an animal off of you, and they didn't want it anymore. Right. But they had obviously received the information. I don't know if you sold it to them at a show or whatever it was. But that was my that was my first captive bred. I'm pretty sure that was my first captive bred retic. Contributing to the addiction, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, That's absolutely. Awesome. That's great. Well, so here's what was really cool: the the Kiowatis, and especially your bloodline they had a, a really thick inky black border on them and kind of a zigzag to the pattern, mm -hmm. which was really unusual among all those other localities. They also had a very vibrant color. Now on the normals, it translates to like dark brown or really dark color. But when you, uh, I started, you know, using the bloodlines and mixing them with, you know, at the time albino was like the coolest thing that you could get. So I bred them um, uh, with an albino and made a dwarf or a super dwarf had albinos and so anyway i thought that that was the locality to do it with because the thick black and the dark color and really translated and to some rich and and that, and that is where a lot of people have done i think with the babies i've produced although i i will say um you know back in the day when i was first producing them back in 2002 and then every year for about five years thereafter um you know, either one or two females would lay eggs for me every year um, I, I don't know if a lot of them actually stayed in, in the in the in the in the hobby. I think a lot of them were, um, you know, didn't didn't uh, were resold, didn't survive, ended up with uh, amateur, you know, people that are just starting out with retics because they wanted something smaller. But mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of them are still being kept in captivity. No, because well, how many uh, did, it, have it, you, did you produce uh, over the years? Uh, hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. Yeah. yeah, and they do not exist anymore. No, no. So, and that's the sad thing. And then the people who actually made good numbers of them, such as yourself, I, I think you've easily produced more Kiowatis than anybody else on the planet. Easily. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you made a couple hundred, so it's not like, yeah, that's not a lot of snakes. That's no. still a fairly rare reptile, right? But, um, but the people who um, followed it through to the, to the next generation, you know, there, there just were so few people that did it. Okay, so this boy here is actually uh, an F1 from Wild Caught Animals, which is completely unrelated to Doc Murdoch's line of Kiowatis. However, Doc Murdoch's line with the selective breeding that he's done and just the exquisite taste that he has, have easily become some of my favorite animals, along with the sentimental value that I used to have some back in the day. Pure Kiowatis completely disappeared for a couple of decades, even though Doc Murdoch was quietly plugging away and producing a clutch every here and there out here on the East Coast. Most people were completely unaware he was selling them for low dollar prices at different local shows and things. And even though he would say they were Kiowatis, a lot of times people forget they start calling them Kalatoas and they were bred into other things. So after meeting up with him, you know, he actually knew the location of some of his original animals and we were able to partner up to bring back that Kiowati bloodline, that Murdoch line, Kiowati bloodline to captivity and preserve it now for future generations. So I was really, really honored uh, to be able to work with him because he was one of the guys that got me into it when I was a kid. I don't know, it was just so cool to see that come full circle. Let me show you what some of these Kiowatis look from some of these more generic kind of F1 non-selectively bred captive bred bloodlines to some of the Third, you know, second and third and fourth generation Doc Murdoch line stuff. So I want to go over a couple of the traits between the different bloodlines that make Kiowatis exactly what they are. Like all retics, they're going to continue to develop in color and contrast as they grow, which is why this two-year-old has got a lot going for him over this one-year-old and this hatchling Kiowati. But I'm going to go ahead and hand him up to Thomas and show you what's up with these guys. So here we have 
a, a really pretty, nice, bright F1 Kiowati off of some wild-caught animals. So it's going to have a much more kind of traditional but also generic super dwarf pattern. These are the animals that many people have easily confused with things like Kalatoa and blended them in, which unfortunately, you know, kind of destroys the validity of a lot of the bloodlines that we have, which is why that stuff is so careful. But one of the traits of Kiowatis is they have a very high saddle count. Can you see how many saddles that guy has? They also tend to be very clean in their pattern, meaning they don't have a lot of black speckling outside of the black dorsal area that they have. Then the other trait that they have is that their black is very dark and the colored area of them tends to be very, very rich. So with the rich colors and the dark blacks, uh, Doc Murdoch was actually able to selectively breed from an animal like this with these very high silver sides. Beautiful animal, uh, but just lacking that, that color richness into an animal like this that has almost complete coverage of gold all the way down the sides. And the black has been made so bold that it, it connects into a really killer, like almost like a zigzag noodly stripe going down the back. And that is one of the traits that is a giveaway to some of these Kalatoa bloodlines that are not really Kalatoas. One of the interesting things that the Kiowatis have, like on this F1, you can see the pattern really bands from top to bottom and it puts a real thick black on the top and below of the side rosettes. Even in the Winslow Murdoch line, which is much more striped out, you can see just how thick some of the black is surrounding those rosettes. That's a trait that most Kalatoas don't have. So because of their chaotic patterns, the brilliant contrast in color, they really have made some of the prettiest morph crosses of super dwarves along the years. They're not quite as colorful as maybe the Slayer Island retics, which you can actually watch this whole video on that locality there. But hopefully today in this video, you've been able to develop an appreciation for the animals and the history that makes them what they are so that we can continue to enjoy these things for generations to come. We'll catch you guys next time.